afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Francis Scott Key program from home. I am Chloe Green. I am the public programs and outreach manager here at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Thank you to everybody who has joined us today and have donated to our FSK from home giving challenge. If some of us are returning to this program, we know that this is a lecture series, but it's also a donation series. So your incredible support really makes a difference and has a big impact on all of our work. So thank you so much. So if you would like to donate this program, check the chat for a donation link that will show up shortly and it will come up towards the end and it will be there in the chat throughout the program. So our conversation today is going to start with our very own executive chair, Mark B. Letzer, who will be in conversation today with a wonderful guest who I won't say too much because that's on Mark and our guests. But Mark, if you want to go ahead and jump on screen and you can unmute and introduce yourself and then your guests and we'll go ahead and get started. Absolutely. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you everybody for being here for FSK from home. So today's presentation is Poetry in Stone, Horatio Greenos Medora and Baltimorean Robert Gilmore Jr.'s role in the rise of an American school of sculpture and is being presented by Dr. Lance Humphreys. Dr. Humphreys received his doctorate in art history from the University of Virginia, where his dissertation explored the art and architectural patronage of Baltimorean Robert Gilmore Jr. One of the most important art collectors in 19th century America, Gilmore was also the individual who in his role as president of the board of managers guided the construction of Baltimore's Washington Monument. Humphreys has published and lectured on the Peel family of artists, as well as Baltimore furniture, including the Morris suite of Baltimore painted furniture in the collection of the Baltimore Museum of Art, well known for its numerous depictions of early 19th century Baltimore country houses. From 2006 to 2010, he was a consultant on the refurnishing of James Madison's Montpelier, focusing on the artwork believed to have been displayed in the mansion. In the fall of 2013, he spoke at Colonial Williamsburg on the emergence of art patronage in Virginia and Maryland in the early years of the American Republic. And in the fall of 2014, he, Lance Humphrey spoke about the Baltimore Washington Monument at a conference at George Washington's Mount Vernon. He recently authored for Homewood House, Johns Hopkins University, an exhibition catalog relating to the townhouses of Charles Carroll of Homewood in Baltimore. At present, Humphreys is working on a study of the Baltimore townhouse, 1780 to 1860. He has recently published an essay on Carrera and Hastings, City Beautiful Designs for Baltimore, including Mount Vernon Place, included in a landscape anthology publication of the National Gallery of Art. In addition to his scholarly work, Humphreys is a founding board member in 2008 of the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy, the first park conservancy in the city of Baltimore. He chaired the Conservancy's Restoration Committee and led to its recent restoration of the Washington Monument. In January of 2018, he was appointed the Conservancy's Executive Director. So Lance, welcome to the Maryland Center for History and Culture's FSK from Home. And that is actually quite an incredible title of Poetry in Stone and how it continues. Can you give us a synopsis of what the sculpture of Adora meant to Robert Gilmore. Uh, hey, Mark, thanks for having me back today. Can you can you all hear me? Can you all hear me, folks? Can, okay, great. Um, well, yeah, Mark, uh, gosh, I think I need, need a nap after that introduction. I've been busy, um, <laughs> but that's great. And obviously, you know, I do a lot of Baltimore topics and Gilmore um, is certainly among them. And I think what's, Interesting about Gilmore, as I don't think you mentioned, is he was one of the founding board members of the Maryland Historical Society, among the many other things he did. And um, what, I, what I'd like to do today is place the commissioning of the Medora, which was in the late 1820s, in really the his, his life and what was important to him at different times as he matured. And um, and what it meant to the rise of the American School of Sculpture, uh, which was he was really influential influential in making happen. So with that, I'll kind of turn to my slides and start this narrative in the 18th century, 
So yes, my, my talk is Poetry in Stone about Horatio Greenow, who is from Boston, and uh, Baltimore's own Robert Gilmore Jr. And I think it's it's going to be it's ho hopefully interesting uh, and some different narratives than folks may have heard about the early 19th century and at the time that Gilmore was very influential in just kind of the rise of American culture in general. Uh, Gilmore Jr. here from Baltimore was the son of Robert Gilmore the first, who was uh, from Scotland and came to the United States and actually landed on the eastern shore in the 1770s but uh, moved to Baltimore very soon after in the early 1780s, like a lot of wealthy merchants did. Uh, Baltimore really boomed right after the Revolutionary War. And if they had an internet at the time, they must have all been on a chat and they said, come to Baltimore because you can make lots of money here because it is amazing how many merchants arrived here in the 1780s and went on to be you know, kind of spectacularly wealthy. Uh, William Patterson would be another one. So through his business connections, uh, Gilmore ended up going, Gilmore Sr. with his family, including uh, the young Robert Gilmore, went to uh, Amsterdam to conduct trade there, obviously a very important merchant port. And through connections there, he met William Bingham of Philadelphia, <clears throat> who was shown here on the lower right, who was really one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest American of the late 18th century, a hugely wealthy merchant. And so his father was building these these rich merchant connections uh, that, you know, in the Anglo-American world, uh, really a, arriving at the pinnacle when with uh, Bingham and others, he was introduced to the House of Bering in London, which they were kind of, they were at the pinnacle of merchant, merchant wealth in uh, England. So <clears throat> Gilmore Jr., who had been born here in America, at an early age, got to see Europe in the 1780s, so he's really a pretty young child at that time, but was exposed to these folks who, A, were very wealthy and also collected art and other art objects, which is part of kind of his background. And he made three trips to Europe, uh, the first one with his father as a child. 1799, he went back for a grand tour, which is what wealthy uh, Europeans did. And then in 1817-18, he went back for another tour of Europe with his wife, Sarah Reeve Ladson here, she was from Charleston. And while there, they were painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence, who had painted the Bearings, who was really the, the most famous portrait painter in Europe at the time, right after the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and so getting these portraits painted, uh, which Gilmore brought back here to Baltimore, um, really signaled that he was part of this, this Anglo-American world of an really incredible wealth uh, and also artistic patronage. So uh, he quickly used the money at his disposal uh, to learn about the world and to kind of, you know, say, I'm part of this world like uh, the Bearings. So Lance, okay, so I have followed Robert Gilmore for most of my career as well, <clears throat> and I've always been fascinated by him and uh, one of the things that I've always wondered, and I know you and I have discussed in the past, what spurred him to become a collector? A very rare thing in America. I mean, the Grand Tour was going on in England, people, and throughout Europe, people were bringing back things from all their European travels. How did this happen here in Maryland, in Baltimore, with Robert Gilmore Jr.? And did he and his wife, Sarah, have any children? Uh, well, that's very interesting, Mark. Um, yes, we have talked about it a long time. So Gilmore, with his wife Sarah had no children and he actually had been married earlier for a couple of years to a, a very wealthy Baltimorean, uh, one of the member of the Cook family. And she died tragically about a year later. So by 1818, um, actually when these pictures were painted, he in fact had no children and he and Sarah would have no children. They would end, end up uh, about a decade later adopting one of her daughters as kind of their child. So he, as a young man, um, going way back uh, about a decade, two decades in 1794, shown here in a drawing in your collection. Oh, sorry, I haven't updated the name on that one, sorry. Um, that's, you're now the Maryland Center for History and Culture, I know that. Um, he was very, he, he had to be a very inquisitive young man. Uh, his father, who was a merchant, did not believe that his two sons, Gilmore being one of them, needed a university education in order to be a merchant. Like that was kind of, you know, icing on the cake. They didn't need that kind of uh, 
<clears throat> detailed study in, but he just somehow was an incredibly inquisitive young individual who ended up learning a lot of things on his own. He learned, his, he, I don't think he spoke Greek, but he could gr read Greek and Latin and you know French and other languages. And some, there must have been some spark inside of him that spurred him on to learn about the world around him. Um, and especially here in the United States in this time, you know, the 17th and 18th century, uh, the Europeans who he had witnessed this a couple of times, uh, they thought of the United States and the Americas in general as kind of this land of uh, Native American Indians and, you know, like that they fought crocodiles that were, you know, 30 feet long in this early print here. <clears throat> and that America was kind of this wasteland of culture. I mean, when you think about it, uh, of course, Native Americans had their own culture, but in this Western view of the world, we had no art objects here. We didn't have, you know, these treasure houses like they had in Europe. And, and he had seen that um, on his on his tours of Europe when he went to France and Italy and London um, and had seen some of the most spectacular uh, artworks that existed, like the Apollo Belvedere up on the upper right. And I don't know if you can see her, but the Medici Venus is the statue in that uh, painting in uh, the lower right there. And just these two statues alone were considered the most beautiful art objects that had ever been made. Uh, they were both in, in Italy, um, <clears throat> all subsequent art of the Renaissance and into the time he lived. Um, these were the models and ideals that uh, future art was based on. And he actually, when he saw the Apollo of Belvedere in um, 1799, 1800, he said no, no, um, no description of it could match its beauty. Um, <clears throat> and this kind of compares to what we had here in the United States, which was basically portraiture at this time. Uh, Charles Wilson Peale, for instance, on the top. And importantly, these portrait artists that we had, like uh, Peale and Copley on the bottom there, uh, they did go to London and, and study. Uh, how to paint and came back to the United States. Uh, Copley didn't actually, but uh, no major sculptors had gone to Europe to study um, the craft of sculpture. So that was something that as a young man with all of his collections, he began to address. And I think with the earliest note, back to your question about when he started and how he started, <clears throat> he must have been interested in collecting as a teenager because there's a very early letter where one of his father's business associates sends him several coins and medals and he says these will hopefully find a place in your collection and and they so clearly even his his father's business associates were encouraging his collecting um, and I think what he was trying to do is he was documenting the world in which he lived uh, the western world and and kind of the United States is, that's not a great word phrase, uh, America's place in world history. So he was the first collector, or not first, but one of the first major collectors of minerals on the lower right there. He collected rare manuscripts. That manuscript in the upper right is a letter written by Queen Elizabeth I that he uh, was able to purchase it from London. He collected coins and medals, uh, one of the greatest coin collections of the early 19th century. Uh, the first medieval illuminated manuscripts in this country, the manuscript on the left there, which is in the Library of Congress now, and, um, and then a, a Greek pot. He's the first American collector who's known to have collected a, to have collected Greek part, pots, pottery, and actually exhibit them from his collection. They were shown at the Pio Museum. So he was incredibly inquisitive and, and acquisitive uh, we didn't have museums here. We didn't have these treasure houses. And if the United States was going to grow as a country, we needed these objects around us in, in order to learn and to grow from. Um, and so like his British counterparts, he collected fantastic uh, old masters. These are just a sampling of some of his works that uh, the very rare quality for this time. And notably for him, he wanted to patronize American art uh, because that was the way our country would uh, kind of have put its place and mark in the world. And he did that for over 50 years from 1794 with this field drawing to uh, a bust of Joel Tanner, a bust by Joel Tanner Hart of Henry Clay from the 1840s. So uh, in over 50 artists that he patronized over time. 
Um, he was able to start that very early here in Baltimore because of artists like George Beck, who came from England, and William Groombridge. Actually, this painting is in your collection now. I think it's probably the second painting he uh, that you all collected, or one of the first two, at least. He gave another one of uh, Washington and his generals at Yorktown by Peel. And these Anglo-American artists uh, patronizing these American, these foreign-born, for lack of a better description, artists led to his then patronage of American artists like Raphael Peel, uh, William Sidney Mount, Thomas Doughty, Thomas Cole. Um, and these were these artists are all considered kind of the founders of the American school of still life genre painting and landscape painting. So, um, and these artists all didn't live here. So he was patronizing. Fortunately for us, Thomas Doughty did come here to Baltimore uh, on a brief visit and painted this wonderful uh, kind of iconic view of Baltimore from Gilmore's seat, Beach Hill, which was west of the city. So lots of things intersecting in his mind about how we need to amass uh, our own treasure houses in the United States in order to advance our culture. That, Lance, that's fascinating. Now, Gilmore was one of the founders. Uh, of the Maryland Historical Society in 1844, and he did the very first painting to come into the collection. In fact, uh, 1845.1 would have been uh, George Washington and his generals at Yorktown. He also gave us, um, you know, the George Beck that you just showed us as well, an extraordinary painting that's actually on view right now. But um, not only do we have a lot of Gilmore's papers, his journals, his travel logs, but also we know we wanted to actually ask you why the construction of the Baltimore Washington, Washington's Monument. How important was that in Gilmore's life? Um, well, the fact that you all have those papers regarding the the construction of the monument, they're they're real, actually they're considered one of the most fantastic sets of documents about building a monument. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure they were Gilmore's at one point because he was in charge, and we're not quite sure how they made it out of his family and into your collection in the late, but very late. You all have owned this for over a hundred years, but. Um, because Gilmore had visited Europe and he had seen Europe, he really, he, there were two things that were very important to him. Um, the founding of our, our national capital in Washington, D.C., which, you know, we, we think of it as Washington, D.C. right now, but I'm sure he thought of it as part of Maryland because the main part of Washington that we have today that where the major monuments are was part of Maryland until it was given to be the capital. And it was and it was very nearby. And so he really thought that our national capital uh, would grow and become a center of learning like other capitals around the world, um, which is interesting because that is not, in fact, what happened uh, during his lifetime, uh, it just fits and starts of getting things going. Uh, but he was avidly watching what was going on there, um, as well as the building of things like the Capitol, which was going to be the seat of our democracy. And based on his knowledge of other countries, uh, he hoped that this would be ornamented with um, paintings and sculptures depicting our national heroes and our founders, of course, George Washington and others. Um, there's a, you know, John Trumbull's in the middle, the signing of the Declaration of Independence that's in the rotunda. And these, these growing symbols of our country, uh, he just was watching you know, very, very closely. And of course, he could go down to Washington without too much effort at the time. And part of this is also um, memorializing George Washington, who was the founder of our country. Um, as we learned when we restored the monument, uh, the really the story of the building of the monument is that's a that's a whole hour long talk in itself. But it, it is, of course, a monument to George Washington. But as we found when we found the cornerstone during the restoration, uh, the last thing that the builders put into the cornerstone was a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And so Gilmore and his contemporaries really saw this monument as a memorial to American national independence, which is something that they very much wanted to celebrate and document. Um, so just really quickly about the monument, you know, there was an early competition and Robert Mills uh, won the competition from Charleston with this very elaborate design. But by the time the cornerstone was laid in 1815, it had been reduced to a, a very different design, which is actually rather like we have today. And construction continued into the early 1820s uh, when it looked like this, uh, largely complete, except for the statue on top. Um, and at that time, this, this monument that had been raised uh, by 
paid for by lotteries, an interesting thing that we don't think of happen, doesn't happen today. That's not what our lotteries pay for so much. Um, he, they, the board of managers ran out of funds for a while, and so they had to renegotiate how they would complete this monument, and I'll talk, touch on that in a minute. So with this project ongoing, and this is where this kind of intersection of things happened with Gilmore in the late 1820s. Um, monuments, as I just showed you, it looks pretty much like that in the early 1820s. And then in 1826 uh, was the semi-centennial of the United States. It's something we don't think about much, uh, 200 and well, we're almost to the 250th celebration. Um, but this was a huge deal to Americans of this period that this American experience had lasted uh, 50 years and that we had a stable government. You know, we had these amazing founding documents like the, you know, obviously the, Fed, the De Declaration of Independence, but obviously the Constitution. And, you know, when you think about France, I mean, France had a revolution in the, in the late 18th century as well. But they had an incredibly unstable government through all of, all of the 19th century and revolutions and the monarchy came back and et cetera. And so Gilmore wanted to document this, this moment in American history in 1826. And he did several things. He started actively collecting documents relating to the, signer of the signers of the Declaration of Independence because they were all disappearing rapidly on July 4th, 1826. Uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, <clears throat> excuse me, died, which is amazing that they both died on the 4th of July in 1826. And the only remaining one was Charles Carroll of Carrollton right here uh, in the Baltimore area. And he wanted to also collect uh, paintings related to, to these founders. And so he asked John Trumbull if he could uh, purchase two of his miniatures. Uh, these miniatures were used by Trumbull to paint his depictions, for instance, in the rotunda of the Capitol. Um, and he bought one that was uh, Otho uh, um, Holland Williams, who's a Marylander, and then one actually William Lawton Smith, who was a Charlestonian, who was actually kind of related to Gilmore's wife. And in 1826, he also uh, commissioned from Gilbert Stuart, Stuart's last portrait of George Washington. Stuart died shortly thereafter. So it's amazing that I don't, he did not know he was commissioning Stuart's last portrait. Um, but it turned out to be that, and that's now in the Walters Art uh, Gallery or Museum, which is fantastic that it actually came back. It left Baltimore for a while. And Gilmore had had a copy after Stuart, the little picture on the left there. And I think it speaks to his interest in the late 1820s for authenticity. He wants, he wants the real deal by the, the artist that actually saw Washington. So there's this story going on. And then at the same time, and this is uh, this is all going to come together in a second here. Uh, you're probably all going, where's Medora? Um, so 4th of July, 1826, it happens in September of 1826. The Board of Managers advertises for a sculptor, uh, it's in the text there, to sculpt a statue of Washington for the top of the monument, which it stood there you know, without a statue since about 1820. Here it is in 1828, just two years later, you can see that the statue has not yet arrived. But uh, from this advertisement, the board of managers hires Enrico Cosici, who was an Italian, who had done a lot of work in the United States Capitol. Actually, most of the work in the United States Capitol up to this time was from Italian artists, some of, uh, actually three of whom worked here as well, Capolano and others. Um, and, and Enrico Cosici was hired to, uh, uh, sculpt this enormous statue of Washington that was going to be on the top. Well, Kosuchi, like others, he, he had not met Washington uh, at this time. Um, he likely based his, his depiction of Washington on uh, John Trumbull's version that was in the Capitol, where actually Kosuchi had worked you know, a couple of years before, uh, because his pose, here's Washington. And, and the other thing that's important about this is that this act took place in the Maryland State the State House of Washington resigning his commission. So it's thought to be a very important Maryland topic that was also of national importance, uh, that, that this would be the sculpture that ended up being on the top of the monument. So uh, this was raised at the top in 1829. And, and the monument was largely complete uh, with the statue by Kosuchi. It is, it is very competent. It's, if you, I know, Mark, you've been up top as I was. It's very, his face is very unusual. I don't know. Certainly from a distance, it looks rather like the Trumbull pose, the, you know, clothing's a little different, but this whole idea of the Washington resigning his commission, which is what is in his hand, 
um, was incredibly important to the forming of the United States and its history. Um, and so this is this is you know who was the available sculptor to do this at the time. Um, and uh, so well, the huge moment, of course, Baltimore was very proud that they got this statue on the top, and then work then work would continue on this. So Lance, you know, this is a, probably the perfect segue since we're into a massive sculpture. With Gilmore being as busy as he was with everything in the 1820s, how does Medora come into the picture? Where does he meet Greeno? How does this all happen? Yeah, well, that, that I mean, that was just an incredible amount of background that I gave you guys, and, and I hope it was interesting along the way. It's a, like a sub story, but you have to remember that in Gilmore's mind, all of his activities, because he was one human being, um, they are all interconnected. And, you know, and that he's trying to accomplish all these things to uh, promote the rise of an American school of art, of, of painters and sculptors, and also to kind of document what's going on here in the United States. And so literally while Enrico Cossucci is uh, sculpting this, this enormous statue in the 1827 to nine period, um, Gilmore on a trip to Washington, which she often did, as I mentioned, he met Horatio Greenow from Boston. And um, they obviously, you know, he struck up a conversation with him. Uh, Greenow had been in Italy briefly on a study tour, um, but um, he he wanted to go back because he felt like he needed more training in order to be, you know, the, the sculptor that he desired to be. And Italy was where one learned how to sculpt because of, I showed you, for instance, the Apollo Belvedere and the Medici Venus. It was it was where sculpture had been created or or at least displayed for you know almost two thousand years at this point. So when he met Greeno, um, he asked him to come to Baltimore to take on a commission that Gilmore was going to do, and there was a discussion of whether he was going to sculpt uh, Gilmore's likeness or whether he was going to create a bust of Gilmore's wife Sarah. And here in 1828, uh, Greenow actually in Gilmore's library, which I wish I could show you an image of that, but it doesn't survive. Um, he sculpted a bust, uh, a, a model basically of Gilmore's wife, Sarah, um, having chosen her over himself to be depicted, excuse me. And this was the first female bust that Greenow had uh, accomplished. The other busts that he did were all of you know famous political figures, which were you know very. I mean, they're they're important pieces of sculpture, but they're also, you know, they're kind of a likeness that has other political overtones and needs. And and the, and the bust of Sarah allowed him to you know you know stretch his artistic muscles and and paint a you know a, be a very a beautiful, elegant woman with this beautiful hair, this drapery. And so while doing this. Um, Greenow asked Gilmore if he would support his trip back to Europe, and Greenow said yes. I'm sorry, Gilmore said yes, that he would, and that he would commission another sculpture. So to suggest how important this moment is to Gilmore, um, this is a portrait of Gilmore in like 1831-32. Uh, the bust of Sarah had just arrived here in the United States. And it is the only American art object that Gilmore that is depicted in this painting of Gilmore. Um, it's a, kind of hidden in the shadow there up on the upper right, but it is definitely this bust. <clears throat> and all around Gilmore, he has these Greek pots. He has these paintings, these kind of drawings and prints, probably after the old masters. Uh, I, I wish there was more of this room depicted. It's clearly trying to depict some kind of space in Gilmore's house with this uh, quote unquote Indian. Uh, <clears throat> a, a Persian type rug or, uh, from the Middle East, uh, very beautiful colors. Hubart was an excellent, these are, it's a tiny little picture. It's about 20 inches tall. Um, but this is how important his, this moment with Greenow was, is that this, this ability to send him back to Italy. So with his commission to Greenow, um, he said, you are at liberty to, to pick whatever you want, whatever you choose, which was really what any painter or sculptor would have wanted. Just a commission, you, you just you choose the topic of your liking and you do your best with it. Um, <clears throat> obviously, when somebody commissioned a portrait of themselves, they're just to say, you know, paint me, and that's what you're going to get. But uh, Greeno was thrilled that he'd been given this liberty by Gilmore to choose uh, a topic. And he chose a moment in uh, Lord Byron's tale, The Corsair, which is a poem 
uh, first published in 1814. Uh, Byron was amazingly popular. Um, I'm sure every, I don't know that uh, Jane Austen talks about it much, but I'm sure many of her hero, her heroines and others were reading uh, Byron as were many Americans. Uh, this kind of very romantic, you know, swashbuckling type of stories uh, with a lot of uh, <clears throat> ups and downs and, you know, you know, sadness and, and beauty and pathos and things like this. And so uh, Greenow decided to choose a moment from the Corsair and just really quickly, it's a very complicated story, but basically there's uh, a woman named Adora and, and Conrad, her beloved, uh, and Conrad wants to go off and fight uh, the Turks basically in Asia Minor, and uh, he leaves uh, much to her, her disappointment, um, and while there he gets captured and he's rescued by a woman named Gilnari. Uh, and they fight, not Gonari and Conrad, they fight and he they escape from this situation that he uh, is in uh, with the Middle Eastern uh, Asia Minor folks. And when he returns, <clears throat> Medora has been waiting and waiting and waiting for him for you know months and months and months. And when he returns, he finds that she has died and she's basically died of grief and remorse and worry that her beloved has not returned. So you can you can read the poem yourself. It's got many, many plot twists, but that's kind of a quick overview. And it was a very popular story, and, and it was often depicted in prints uh, in the period. Uh, on the left shows Medora uh, kind of just pining uh, on Conrad's shoulder because he's about to leave. She's very sad and distraught. And then, and then on the right, there's a print showing uh, Medora just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting and, and you know, hoping that Conrad will return. I mean, there are many, many depictions of, from this story. Um, but the moment that Greenout chose, which is when the death of Medora, uh, when he finds her dead at the end of the, at the end of his uh, his travels, uh, was considered uh, among the beauties of Byron, which is this publication then of the others like this, which chose. <clears throat> what contemporaries thought were like the most beautiful, tragic, uh, you know, meaningful moments in Byron's stories. And her death was considered one of them, uh, the way the way it's narrated in the poem. And and it's not surprising why Greenout chose this moment, because when uh, Conrad comes back and and sees Medora dead, uh, Gonari is there as well. And that's a very complicated side story that we can't really get into right now. But um, some of the depictions of Medora, uh, the poetic depictions of her on her deathbed, uh, talk about that she looks like she's sleeping, uh, but that her lids, that's the first one I've highlighted, that her lids were of snow, which of course evokes marble. Uh, then down below, the white shroud with each extended tress, long, fair, but spread in utter lifelessness. So here we have this, you know, the idea of white, of course, marble was white. And then the last one, these and the pale pure cheek became the beer, but she is nothing, wherefore is he here? He asked no questions. All were answered now by the first glance on that still marble brow. Um, <clears throat> so all of these depictions of Mor Medora uh, as seen by Conrad, I'm sure, uh, and, and Greenhouse says as much that they're just perfect for this idea of a, a, a piece of sculpture in marble because of all this kind of purity, <clears throat> excuse me, purity that these depictions, um, narrative depictions suggest. So he did depict Medora um, at the moment Conrad sees her on her deathbed. Um, there are some prints showing her on her deathbed, like the one at the top. Uh, all of them actually, it is quite, it's mentioned that she held, she had a little nosegay of flowers in her hand as if she was just waiting to present this to Conrad on his return. Um, and you can see the both this, the print as well as the actual sculpture by uh, Greenow show her with this. Um, the rather surprising thing in Greenow's statue is that she is so, shown with her breasts exposed. Uh, there's really no hint in the poetry that and the poem itself that she was in any way nude she's just thought to be you know found dead on her deathbed um and 
so that I think that this was just some artistic license on Greenhouse part because he wanted to really show his skill at depicting the human body. Um, and, and there is a lot of skill, quite frankly, in showing the human body uh, as covered by cloth. That was kind of a you know light motif of many, many sculptors over time. Of uh, you can see her legs, and if I showed you her feet in a minute, you'll see how they're covered with this very thin diaphanous cloth, but that that reveals her body. So this is the moment he chose, uh, and he obviously had influences to do this. Uh, but I'd like to talk about how this was perceived a little bit at this moment. Um, Medora on her deathbed. They actually, when this was exhibited here in the United States, which I'll talk about in a minute, they had the poem hanging right next to her so people could read it. And I think that this, this one excerpt from when it was exhibited in Boston uh, is really typical of how they viewed this. Uh, it says, the last pang of expiring nature seemed linked in the expression of that face with the first rapture of never ending joy. You felt as you looked at it, the depths of the human heart stirred up and rising to connect themselves with the holy happiness of another life. And so while she's dead, uh, she is dead in the, at this moment in the poem, uh, the early Victorians really thought of uh, death and uh, life and death as this transition that you're, gonna, you're, you're going to live in an afterlife that obviously uh, to them was thought to be more beautiful and wonderful. And that there was this kind of seamless transition as we as we died and then we just kind of moved on to heaven. Um, and that that I think he's trying to uh, project that on the face that she's very calm and it doesn't look I mean, you know, she supposedly died of worry and 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 fear that, Medora, that Conrad somehow is deceased, but that ultimately her transition to the afterlife was uh, a beautiful one. And I think that it's quite obvious that Greenow was looking at uh, tomb sculptures, which of course exhibited were all over Europe and certainly in Italy, um, which often showed the deceased on top of their, uh, if you were very, very wealthy, showed the deceased, you know, laid out, uh, you know, rather lifelike, like they're sleeping. Um, and that, that this would have been a common thing that he was seeing. I mean, I don't know that he saw this particular one in Luca, but they're just so uh, prevalent in Europe, especially from the Renaissance and Baroque periods, that uh, it's easy to see how he could um, visualize this sculpture of Medora. Um, and, and yet in the same time, he's kind of referencing these tombs. So it's this kind of life and death thing that's combined in the sculpture. So Lance, Medora is spectacular, obviously, and anybody looking at her today doesn't even give it a second thought that she's partially nude. How was she perceived when she arrived in the United States? Uh, well, that is a, a really important question and one that uh, certainly affected Gilmore's uh, thoughts on it, uh, not his own personal thoughts, but his, his thoughts about how sculpture uh, was perceived here in the United States. Um, at the same time, or really after when Gilmore sends Greenow back to uh, Italy, uh, a statue that Greenow uh, created called the Chanting Cherubs, it's shown here in a print, it has never been found in 100, almost 200 years now, it's based as a kind of a copy of two of uh, uh, cherubs in a painting by Raphael. Uh, when this statue arrived um, here in the United States, um, it was shown in Boston because Greenow was from Boston, and Bostonians were so disturbed by uh, the nudity of these little cherubs, even though the cherubs are supposed to be heavenly, that they actually had little gold or cloth, little loincloths created to hang over their, their private parts so that no one would be offended by this complete nudity. And this got a lot of press in um in Bostonian press and Bostonian press and elsewhere, just you know, that oh, this is so shocking that these these little cherubs have to be covered in order for people to find them acceptable. Um, just kind of briefly, this is a theme that uh, Francis Trollope would talk about in the Domestic Manners of the Americans, which is from 1832. Um, when I'll talk about her exact quotes, but this this concern and worry about uh, viewing nude sculptures at this time. 
Um, unlike Europe, we didn't have the Apollo Belvedere here. We didn't have all these public buildings with, uh, you know, if you've been to Paris or London or Rome, wherever, they're all, all, there's so many nude sculptures that are just standalone sculptures or part of architecture uh, that um, Europeans were very used to seeing this in their public spaces, let alone in museums. So when, when the Medora came and was exhibited here in, in Boston in 1833-34, um, while that one quote that I, I read to you uh, was uh, very uh, poetic about the value and the beauty of this sculpture, the exhibitors in Boston decided to set aside a special time that ladies would come and view it in the morning and then uh, the gentlemen could see it in the afternoon and that basically they split up the company so that men and women did not see the statue at the same time, which is kind of hard for us to believe, I think, 200 years later. Um, but this, and, and Gilmore heard about these uh, reviews because he had folks in Boston who would send him things like that. And he was just very, I mean, he doesn't comment directly on it, but it's part of, it's part of what we hear from him. Uh, very disappointed in this reception of, I mean, artists obviously thought that this uh, sculpture was incredibly beautiful and well-crafted, and but the public was very uncomfortable. And um, Trollope herself, I mentioned her a minute ago, when she was in Philadelphia in 1830 and 30, but this was published in 1832, so it's really exactly the same time. Uh, the Philadelphia Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which still exists today, uh, they had a, a a sculpture room of antique sculptures. There were big copies because things like the Apollo Belvedere and the Medici Venus were, you know, the ideal beauties of the time, um, and that all artists wanted to copy them. Uh, they would have had copies of the Apollo Belvedere and the Medici Venus and other famous works from antiquity. Well, there was a special room for these antique casts, and when Francis Trollope goes to visit the, uh, the Academy. She sees a sign on the door, and th this is actually an engraving from the first publication of <clears throat> her work. Um, she was there with a traveling companion. There's supposed to be the two women on the right. And this elderly lady over on the left comes up and says, oh, ma'am, the ladies like to go into that room by themselves wh where there be no gentlemen watching them. Um, and Trollope was just, you know, just gobsmacked by this response and wrote at length about her impressions of Americans, which were quite frankly often derogatory because she thought we were a bunch of savages by comparison to England. But um, but I think this one quote here really sums up it, you know, what was happening with Greenow's own sculpture because she said, were the antique gallery thrown open to mix parties of ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, this worry would soon cease. Till America has reached the degree of refinement which permits of this, the antique cast should not be exhibited to ladies at all. I never felt my delicacy shocked at the Louvre, but I strongly, I was strongly tempted to resent as an affront the hint I received that I might steal a glance at what was deemed indecent. Um, so she really hit the nail on the head with this American concern of viewing nude sculptures. Um, and it's and it's obviously coming, I mean, in Gilmore's, you know, I'm sure he read Trollope. Um, he, he's hearing about how his sculpture is being perceived in Boston, and this was very distressing to him. Um, he actually asked other exhibitors to exhibit it in New York and Philadelphia. Um, and they didn't get back to him. Rubens Peel, who had run the Peel Museum here in um, Baltimore for a while, he uh, responded to Gilmore about his New York Museum at the time that he was busy showing the Siamese twins and that he didn't have time to exhibit uh, this statue because I think, I, I think he was a little concerned about showing it. Uh, but that he had this kind of popular novelty, these are human, you know, human beings, Siamese twins, um, that, were, that were actually making him money. So um, Gilmore is hearing this. He hasn't gotten the statue yet, but he's hearing how it's being received in other cities. And, and he's finding that very disappointing, considering uh, how important the sculpture was to him. Well, that's, and we know that Medora arrives on these shores in 1833, but what is Greeno working on apart from Medora? I mean, he, he was obviously very prolific. So what else was he doing at the same time? Well, yes, that, that's, uh, 
I just can't imagine all of the thoughts that are going through Gilmore's head from 1826 to 1832. Um, in 1832, uh, Greenow, which is when he's, you know, kind of finishing the Medora, um, he has been asked by uh, our federal government to create a statue of George Washington for the rotunda of the Capitol. He actually asked Gilmore if he, if Gilmore could put in a good word for him, um, because Gilmore was had very influential friends, his nephew Benjamin Chu Howard who had married Jane Gilmore was actually in Congress at this time, I think, and just he knew a lot of people. And, and Greenhouse said that he hoped that this commission to sculpt a statue of Washington, which was actually, so this was on the centennial of George Washington's birth in 1830, the centennials in 1832, uh, that Congress had finally given him this, you know, that him, an American sculptor, uh, this opportunity, he actually says, to uh, to appear before the public as a national artist. And this goes back to Gilmore's belief that somehow what our government, our federal government, is commissioning, that this is, these are the artists of national import, the, like Trumbull, who had, had painted here. Uh, the other paintings that actually fill the rest of these are all the Trumbulls, I think, uh, not all of them not in that picture. Um, in the other four artists who created the other four paintings, actually Gilmore owned work by three of the others um, and commissioned work by them. And so this, this rotunda of the Capitol was incredibly important to Gilmore as you know, the seat of our democracy, but also um, the place where our, our arts and culture would be demonstrated to the world, basically. This is what we were creating. Uh, believe it or not, Congress had twice uh, made motions to, or made motions or decrees or whatever you want to call them, to to pay to have a sculpture of Washington done. The second one was when he died in 1799, but that had never happened in, in now 30 years. And so this long awaited sculpture uh, for the rotunda was going to happen soon. Obviously, Gilmore has been busy by 1832 erecting the first monument to Washington, which you know, which is what one of the earlier memorials was supposed to be. And so the fact that Baltimoreans um, erected the first monument to Washington is something that honored him on that scale. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. You would expect the first Washington monument to be in Washington, D.C., but that is just not where our government was at the time of kind of patronizing uh, artists uh, as well as commissioning things. So <clears throat> Greenow gets this commission in 1832, just as he is finishing Medora. Uh, Gilmore is very excited that, you know, that he, he knows this sculptor, he's promoted his work. Um, and eventually in 1841, it gets sent uh, to the United States from Italy. It's on the right. I don't know how many of you all have seen it. Um, it was intended for the rotunda, as I said. It was installed in 1841, um, and believe it or not, was only in the rotunda for three years, well, actually two years, I think, um, because when it arrived, um, there were all these questions and concerns and complaints about why the father of our country was shown partially nude. Um, clearly, Greenow had based his, his sculpture on what they thought the Olympian Zeus looked like. There are a lot of prints of descriptions of the Olympian Zeus, uh, contemporary print showing Zeus, uh, you know, you can see how similar it is. I think what's interesting is that uh, kind of going back to the Washington Monument here in, uh, in Baltimore, George Washington is shown basically as not resigning his commission, which is uh, as commander in chief, but he's actually, he's giving back his sword to the public, which is what's going on here, which is really the same, it's the same moment. It's the same idea that he is giving back his military power to the people, which was thought to be this tremendous um, act of patriotism, because in the past, you know, no one gave up their, their military power, or someone would kill you for your military power, or you die or whatever, but to actually give back your military power to the people, is one of the most you know, amazing things that George Washington did as a uh, kind of citizen. And so he's depicted in this pose, giving back his military power. Even Gilmore's very good friend, Philip Hone in New York, who is a you know, very educated uh, collector like Gilmore, 
uh, he described Washington as looking like he'd just come from the bath and had and had had his towel over his his you know waist and and feet there. So this was so controversial um, that actually was moved outside to the lawn of the rotunda of uh, the Capitol in general. It ended up going finally. Thank, thankfully to preserve it, it went into the Smithsonian building where it was kept inside and, and now at the Museum of American History. Um, but to Gilmore, this was, this was the most important commission of the early 19th century, a statue of Washington for the rotunda of the Capitol. You know, our founder, the United States' founder, and in the seat of our democracy. And he thought of his his role in this that you know having commissioned this bust of his wife and sent Medora uh, sent it sent Greenow back to Italy in order to create the Medora which was his first ideal sculpture that it was not a you know, portrait bust it was his first ideal sculpture that basically he was the patron who allowed um, Washington to uh, to be built this this statue <clears throat> so it was incredibly important to him that you know, he, he was kind of involved in creating this moment. And, well, yep. I was going to say, I know that we're, we're coming to a close, but I yep. want to say, I know that uh, this wonderful um, Saunders miniature um, of Gilmore, but what happens to Medora after she arrives here? What it, What is, you know, how can we know what was her journey after arriving? Yeah, so really quickly, so basically this quote here I have is just that Gil Gilmore was very disappointed in uh, the American public's response to this statue, uh, as he said, in the last year of his life, when he died, uh, he, he was not as in as great a fina financial position as he wanted to be. But um, one of his uh, nephews, William Gilmore, actually bought the Gilmore, the Medora from um, his uncle. And then it was sold from that William Gilmore's uh, auction in 1863, which was a uh, Franklin Street house, kind of one block off of Charles. At this sale, it was purchased uh, by another Gilmore family member who owned it until the 1880s. And then it was uh, sold at his sale to a member of the Ellicott family, um, about which I do not know too much, which is frustrating because basically after the Ellicotts own it in the late 19th century, uh, the statue disappears, and no one seems to know where it was. Uh, and that it was not until 1949, when Anna Wells Rutledge, who was actually worked at the Maryland Historical Society, and um, she worked at the Peabody Institute as well, um, she was doing an article on Gilmore, and she learned that uh, the Parkers, Sumner Parker and his wife, and I always pronounce it poorly, Did you, is it Dedria? Is that Dedria. how you? Yes, Dedria. Dedria. Yeah, his wife. Um, they had built this exotic uh, house slash castle out um, in uh, Baltimore County, called now called the Cloisters. Or, and and at the Cloisters, they had actually uh, gathered a, many architectural fragments, kind of from around the world, uh, in a medieval character uh, that were built into this house that they were erecting. And one of them, actually, uh, that bay window we can see on the right. Uh, with the red frames. Uh, that is from uh, Robert Gilmore III, who was Gilmore's, Gilmore, I'm dealing with his nephew, uh, <clears throat> which uh, his 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 castle, his folly, uh, Glen Ellen, which by the 1920s and 30s had fallen into ruin. Uh, they rescued this huge bay window and a couple of the pieces uh, to be part of their house. And somewhere uh, before 1949, uh, they found the Medora uh, you know, some Baltimore collector, we don't know who, I wish we did, it's it's amazing we don't. Um, and they installed the Medora in a crypt in the basement of, that they had built. Um, we know it's there in 1949 because it's mentioned in the newspapers that it's in the crypt at uh, the Cloisters. And I think, Mark, you said that Sumner had just died right before that, is that correct? He died in 1946, so yeah, so in that period that she gets placed on top of his tomb. He's on top, yeah. So here she. This is this this is the photograph. It's the only one we have. It's from the night, probably the 1980s. Uh, Bill Johnston, a curator at the Walters, uh, knew about it, and it was actually included in an exhibit about Baltimore collecting. Uh, he took this uh, photograph, we believe, um, 
in the cloisters in the in the crypt area and she is uh, sitting on top of this box wooden box that then is on top of several pedestals that are still with it um i i really think that this box may have been part of its original display uh, you can see there's like a cord or something there i wouldn't be surprised if this was originally covered with green baize, which is a type of fabric they used in the early 19th century all the time in exhibitions and to block things off and to just kind of cordon rooms. And it, you know, there's always green baize. You often see that as a tablecloth in, in paintings. You see these green tablecloths that was often baize. Um, it may have been covered in cloth originally with some kind of a, you know decorative ribboning around it. Um, but obviously, the box itself is in pretty tough shape in that photograph. and and I don't, I don't think that that has not since accompanied uh, the Medora on her trip uh, through time. So it was there um, and then brought to this exhibit at the uh, Walters in the early 1980s. And then it was on loan to the Baltimore Museum of Art for a long time. Um, and then thankfully, um, you all at the Maryland Historical Society have brought it into the Historical Society. I'm never gonna change on that, Mark, I'm sorry. Yeah, I get it. It's Maryland funny. Historical Society at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, and, um, and and now it's back on view, uh, which is fantastic um, because th there's so much related to Gilmore at the Maryland Historical Society. And obviously, as one of your founders, uh, you know, this is something that was very important to him. He thought it was important to history. It was important to the rise of American sculpture and the whole school of sculpture. Um, you know, after after Greenhouse's lifetime in the late 19th century, there are all sorts of American sculptors working and, and producing very beautiful works. Um, and, and there's no longer this issue of uh, nudity and this kind of prudery that Americans had to sculpture during Gilmore's lifetime because it had, it had now been, become part of the fabric of what Americans saw routinely. And so it's rather surprising that this um, statue, uh, which was so important in, in Greenhouse's career and kind of as he's the, considered the first American sculptor with artistic training, um, that, you know, despite these disappointments that Gilmore clearly felt, and I'm sure Greenhouse was disappointed too, um, although it, you know, was admired for its beauty, it, it really speaks to 19th century culture, um, you know, up and down the coast and, you know, wherever there were artists and sculptors working. Um, and I think having found this, I'm just thrilled that it's back where so much other Gilmore material is um, and that it's on view because it is really, it's, a, you know, as this, I, I love this image from looking this way, you can just see this amazing detail that he carved, um, and it, 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 considering that we don't know where, where it was for a good 50 years, um, it's in remarkable condition, I think, for you know, this thing is now going to be 200 years old in about what a decade here. Um, and as the first ideal sculpture created by an American sculptor, it's just an incredibly important part of history. So um, this has been, a on my end, this has been kind of a what I love about Gilmore, I'm so thrilled I did him as a dissertation topic, is that um, just this one statue um, has so many narratives about his life and about American culture at the, at the time. Um, and we are really fortunate with him because there is a tremendous amount of writing, you know, letters to and from him that survive. And he was incredibly articulate about what this all meant to him. Um, and that we're fortunate to have that record uh, because a lot of collectors and patrons, a lot of, you know, especially in the 19th century United States, there's very little that survives about what any of it meant to them. And Gilmore wrote so prolifically that we really know what this meant to him. And I think that that's, that's, it's remarkable and it's remarkable that he's a Baltimorean uh, and that, you know, something this, many things important to the rise of American culture were accomplished Lance, by this has been... this Baltimorean. Over to you. This has been fabulous, and I know that uh, we're probably going to have a little bit of time for questions. I know Chloe and or Margo will come back, but um, yep. this was this was very illuminating, and uh, I think for many people that wonder what is the point of Medora, I think today was incredibly illustrative. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Is that that's your, for you guys to figure out. Um, hi, Lance and Mark. So I'm going to jump back on. Thank you guys hi, so much for your talk. We actually do. We had a couple questions in the chat. 
sure. floated by. There's been a lot of praise. It sounds like old friends. <laughs> We're fans of y'all's work um, saying thank you. But we did have a couple questions. And so we can allow time if you guys have time just to ask. Um, I'm good. Yeah, if the, yeah, that's great. Okay, wonderful. Where well, we have our first question asked kind of early on. Um, when someone was asking, wasn't Robert Gilmore the first? immigrated from Scotland in business with Robert Morris, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And maybe that's what, what spurred Robert Gilmore Jr. to collect items from the signers? Uh, well, I, I do believe that Robert Gilmore the first, he was, he was, he did do business dealings with Robert Morris. Um, I I mean, Gilmore also, I mean, he knew Charles Carroll Carrollton here in Baltimore. Um, I, I don't know that it's that direct connection, um, but he does say in the mid 1820s, uh, they, Americans, especially with John Quincy Adams and Thomas Jefferson um, dying um, on the 4th of July, 1826, um, they, uh, people interested in, in, in kind of documenting American history, which Gilmore obviously was, um, they realized that that generation was dying and that with their deaths their documents were being dispersed and he actually mentions in several letters that he knows the son of some you know signer i don't remember who it is and that oh when he died you know he his son destroyed all the papers and so there's this concern by him and people like him that we are going to lose the ability to tell the story of the american revolution if we don't save these documents and you know you have to think about it there were a couple of historical societies uh, the mhs was not uh, not founded yet but there were a couple of historical societies but you know that we didn't have the national archives on there there weren't places that were re retaining these early i mean the official government documents yes um, but he even, he even had concern about those. He said, oh, I learned that there's copies of the Declaration of, of Independence kind of moldering in a room. Maybe they'd have a better place in my collection. So uh, there was this general concern that that generation was dying, the Robert Morris's and, and whatnot, and, and that if someone didn't try to preserve this, it would just disappear. And I think the important thing is, and then we wouldn't be able to tell this story, which is the story he wanted to keep. Lance, it's really funny that you say that because honestly, a lot of historical societies are being formed around the country with that very worry. You know, I know ours yes. certainly was. I know Boston starts in the 1820s, Virginia starts in the 30s. So a lot of them have that same concern. The revolutionary generation is dying. How do we preserve these artifacts and these documents? So I think that was the impetus of many historical societies being formed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a who knew in a way, but yeah. the, the, the they weren't there. There were, like I said, like with Gilmore and his own stuff, there were no treasure houses full of stuff, which is what these, you know, historical societies end up being. But we didn't have the infrastructure at the time to, for them to be kept. So it's 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 a it's a great. I mean, it's just a fascinating story that that's what um, they were thinking about, because I think we we're so far beyond the revolution and the, and the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that we forget how, like I said earlier, like, you know, how special and rare this was that we had broken away from a huge country, the most powerful country in the world, probably or one of them, and that we had stayed stable. And so that was important to them. Let's get to the next question, because I could talk about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for elaborating, Lance. Yeah. Our last, our last question comes from Elaine Rice. Bachman. Oh dear, what's she going to ask? <laughs> She's just asking if you have time, can you put Gilmore's role in the formation of the Peabody Art Collection into context vis a vis his collecting? Uh, if if I have time right now or in the future, does she mean now? I, yep, I guess now. Right now. Okay, well, really quickly. Um, so the, P, the Peabody uh, Art Collection, which um, you know, not a lot of people know about. I think, it, and I think it's fascinating. Uh, when George Peabody founded the the Peabody Institute, um, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be not only a library, uh, but it was supposed to have an art gallery, uh, which it did. And actually, they had a whole room there of, of casts after the antique, like the Apollo Belvedere and things. So this is in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. 
And, um, you know, it's before the BMA, it's before the Walters that it was uh, like the Maryland Historical Society in a slightly different way. I mean, they all had paintings that they were displaying and, and, and documents and things. Well, one of the founders of the Peabody Institute, uh, uh, Charles Eaton, um, he donated his collection to the Peabody when he died, I think in the 1890s, I think it is. And um, he had actually been collecting, Eaton had been collecting here in, in Baltimore you know, for 30 or 40 years, um, you know, easily 30 or 40 years. And, and he had a small bit, small piece of his collection, especially in his drawing collection, uh, are works that he, he had purchased from, we're not quite sure how, but when, when Gilmore's art collection was dispersed, including his drawing collection, various nephews got chunks of it, and Eaton somehow, we don't know quite from which nephew he got it, um, he purchased a number of drawings and actually, and then he had on other reasons, he had some paintings, um, like that little George Washington I showed that is in the POD art collection. Um, and so with his giving, with Eaton giving his collection to the Peabody, uh, some of Gilmore's things were preserved there, which is yet another miracle. The other chunk of his drawing collection that survives were somewhat intact was purchased by a Bostonian and ended up at, at Harvard, uh, maybe, you know, 100 print, 100, you know, 150 prints and drawings. But of both of them, the, so those are the most contained chunks of Gilmore's drawing and print collection. Uh, but that's really it. All the rest of it was dispersed. Um, I mean, the MHS has a few things, but nothing that came to them on block. So that's Gilmore's role in kind of the Peabody art collection, um, which was the, you know, we just don't think of the Peabody these days as an art repository, but it definitely was in the late 19th century. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lance, for taking time to answer that. I know Elaine no, no. appreciates it a lot. No, I have no problem. I, <laughs> okay. when I think it's a great story to talk about. Um, absolutely. So thank you, everybody who stuck around with us a little after one. Thank you, Mark and Lance, for being flexible and for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And there are links in the chat about we have an upcoming Claire McArdle opening exhibit party on Saturday. So if you can make it out to our museum, please join us. It will be exclusive and lovely. And we get to see all kinds of wonderful objects. But in the meantime, everybody had a wonderful day. Thank you, Jim. Yes. Can I have one question? I have had a couple of people ask me if this is going to be placed online afterwards. Yes, yeah, thank you. So this whole meeting has been recorded and it will be edited by some wonderful editing staff we have and it will be posted to our virtual program archive, which will be sent to all of our registrants a follow-up email after this program. Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for asking that. All right, everybody take care. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.